Will frozen people really be able to come back to life in the future? Currently, bringing someone back to life is only possible in movies and TV shows. But the search for eternal life has been stimulating human imagination for centuries. For those who are afraid of aging and death, there is a human preservation process that could be the answer. Many claim it is the key to immortality. This process can help you return to life after resuscitation. So is it possible to cheat death? What is the science behind cryonics? Is it a hoax or a scientific breakthrough? Today you'll get to know everything about the great controversy surrounding cryogenics. Stay with me until the end to find out if this could be the procedure that finally leads us to immortality. The concept of freezing people to resurrect them in the future is not new. Since the 19th century, some science fiction writers have been imagining this possibility. Everything started in 1987 when Kielich and Piquet managed to liquefy oxygen. Experiments were in full swing at that time and soon there were liquid versions of other gases. For instance, in 1884, hydrogen was the first gas to be converted into mist. In 1982, Mr. James Derer came up with a vacuum insulated container for storing cryogenic liquids, making it easier to work with liquefied gases. In the following years, experts managed to liquefy an increasing number of gases, including the last one, helium. The liquid form of this gas was first used in 1908. Meanwhile, more and more industries discovered the usefulness of cryogenic technology. In 1961, cryosurgery was first practiced in the United States. Scientists found out that slow cooling could destroy human tissues harmful to health. In the United States, liquid nitrogen was used for this purpose and a few years later, doctors in South Africa also used the method there. The spaceflight industry also introduced cryogenic technology in the 20th century. In the same year, the American Atlas Center rocket used liquid hydrogen and liquid nitrogen for the first time in the space program. The medical and aerospace industries are just examples of sectors where cryogenic technology has been used for a long time. Cryogenics has also long assumed a prominent role in scientific research, the shipping industry, and the mass production of liquefied gases in air separation units. But after all, what really is cryogenics? Well, that's the practice of freezing the body at sub-zero temperatures in the hope that future technology can bring it back to life. Sounds like a good concept for a sci-fi movie, doesn't it? The process is like this. Once you're declared legally dead, cryopreservation can begin. To protect the brain tissue, blood circulation and breathing are temporarily restored with CPR and an oxygen mask until specialty drugs can be injected. A medical team then cools the body, placing it in an icy water bath and injecting blood thinners to prevent blood clotting. Within 24 hours of death, the body is transported to the cryopreservation center where it is safely preserved. The average human body is made up of 60% water. If not frozen correctly, the water in our cells would become ice. Ice expands in volume and forms crystal networks, putting pressure on cell walls and blood vessels, potentially causing cell and tissue damage. If the ultimate goal of cryonics is to restore your body to a healthy living condition at some point in the future, a body full of damaged cells won't be very useful. This is where a process known as vitrification comes to the rescue. Vitrification allows the body to be frozen in time. Glycerol and dimethyl sulfoxide are common cryoprotectants used before freezing begins. Once your body has been safely vitrified, it will be lowered into a cryopreservation tank, your new frozen home, so to speak. In the near future, your body will be kept at minus 196 degrees Celsius with the help of liquid nitrogen. This will safeguard your body from any deterioration for potentially thousands of years. 
The first ever case connected to cryonics involves James Arnold, an English doctor who utilized extreme cold in 1819 to freeze the tumors of cancer patients. He also conducted the first cold surgery in 1845. Cryotherapy is still used today to treat cancer. Two years later, in 1967, we witnessed the first human being subjected to cryonics. James Bedford, a psychologist who died from cancer at the age of 73. His body was frozen in a liquid nitrogen tank and remains there to this day at the Walker Estation Foundation, one of the world's leading cryonics organizations. Starting from the 1970s, cryonics shifted its emphasis on preserving human cells for various types of medical treatments. The technique was familiar but it took a significant leap in 1983 when scientists at Manish University in Australia successfully managed to freeze the first human embryo. In addition, they managed to facilitate the first successful IVF births using frozen embryos. From then on, the cryopreservation of human blood, stem cells, embryos, sperm and eggs has been utilized in over 300,000 births. As time passed, the technology to freeze bodies has seen significant evolution. Up to now, about 250 people have been frozen after dying, hoping to be revived in the future. Moreover, 10 cats, 7 dogs and a parrot also underwent the same procedure. And that's not all there is. There is also a waiting list comprising over 2,000 living people who are awaiting their death to undergo the procedure. The cost of the procedure ranges from $28,000 to $200,000 depending on the preservation time and the contracted plan. Imagine that you could simply sleep for a hundred years, wake up in the future and be totally okay, or at least improve. However, despite decades of the existence of this concept, we are not yet sure if it can work or not. What's the reason? Well, to start with, nobody has been cryogenically frozen and revived yet, although we've had some success with animals. A study has revived a tardigrade, also known as water bear, which had been frozen for over 30 years. However, referencing these animals doesn't constitute a strong argument for the success of cryonics. That's because they're tiny, less than a millimeter long and can be incredibly resilient. Would you have the bravery to join the cryonics waitlist in the near future and test the chance of being revived? Well, thank you for sticking around till the end and see you in the next video on the channel.